Well, if anybody heard the background of the loon, that means it's one o'clock, at least here. <laughs> I'm not going to say where I am. We do have a quorum. So uh, this is the Energy and Utilities Finance and Policy Committee meeting for Thursday, April 23rd. Welcome to a new reality. And if Senator Marty is now coming in. We do have a quorum present. On the agenda today is one bill, Senator Rarick's bill 4409, Energy Conservation and Optimi Optimization Act. Um, this is new for almost all of us, so we'll sort of try and uh, get through it as well as we can. Um, I see uh, Commissioner Kelly. Um, we will, I will call upon you as we go through this, uh, but obviously we want to uh, try and move the bill today. It will go to the floor. It has to be diverted from the floor to rules if the committee does pass it. So um, first off, there is an A1 amendment. Senator Rarick would move the A1 amendment to get the bill in the shape that he wishes for the presentation. This is an author's amendment. All those in favor of the A1 amendment signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Senator Rarick to your amended 4409. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, uh, you know, this is uh, a reform to the SIP program is something that has been uh, being worked on for a number of years. Um, I was the chief author of the bill last year. Um, a number of uh, stakeholders uh, were working on it and um, there was concern around it. I, I've held uh, many different meetings with folks uh, and we know that the bill did not move last year because of some of the concerns. Um, this bill uh, took into account uh, some of those uh, concerns and we're uh, still uh, listening. And that's the one thing I, I do know. Um, I have, in this new reality, uh, I have had a few different conference calls uh, with opponents of the bill to hear their concerns and continue to bring those forward. And you'll see some changes reflected in this that we'll get to um, shortly uh, as we continue to address that. And, and I know uh, in some of those conference calls, uh, I heard a concern that um, some felt they weren't included along in the process. And, and I know Senator Hoffman uh, heard the same concern. And I, I just want to let folk, all folks know that I've been available all along the way and, and I continue to be available. I have a couple of conference calls scheduled here in the next uh, couple of days. Um, so I'm going to continue to listen to the concerns and, and talk with folks to see if there are some tweaks that uh, can be made if, um, if there are things that we feel we need to address, but I feel the bill in this form is uh, is pretty much where we need to be. And uh, I can do a quick little walkthrough of the, the bill itself and what it is doing, if that is what the chair uh, would like at this time. Senator Rarick, proceed and then anything that you might have missed, uh, uh, Ms. Fontaine can uh, clean up if she'll be the cleanup batter in this case. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So um, in the first, or actually section two of the bill, it talks about innovative clean technologies and it, it gives some definitions as to what uh, is going to be um, in that category. And I won't go through everything, but like number one is something that's environmentally superior to technologies currently in use. Um, Another one would be something that's not wide, widely deployed by the utility industry. This is kind of looking forward and saying, what is out there? We all know technologies are coming forward that we're not even aware of yet. And we're trying to incorporate that into the bill to, to make sure that we're not coming back to have to readdress these things year after year. Um, we, all, we all know that there are shifts happening, um, new technologies coming. And so this is trying to capture those and say these will be allowed to be considered um, under the, the new program, it, what we used to call SIP, uh, now ECO. 
the uh, Energy Conservation Optimization Act. Um, one of the concerns that we heard in, in this section of the bill was the spend that was allowed, that it was going to allow um, each utility to spend up to $5 million a year and have that put on their rate case. Um, this amendment reflects a change to that. We have lowered it. Um, for those uh, utilities that provide service to over 200,000 people, which would be Excel Energy, they would be limited to $6 million over three year period, so 2 million a year. And for the others, it would be 3 million over a three year period, so 1 million a year. So we were listening, uh, you know, we cannot eliminate the spend completely, but uh, I, I will address a little later, you know, why I believe that some spending is required in order for savings on the back end. Um, <clears throat> Section three, um, talking about optimization. And this is where we are going to allow uh, energy management. So for folks who have a water heater or you know whatever uh, device it is, putting it on the control of the utility where they can shut it off during high demand or cycle uses, that is a way that they can lower the demand on the grid and not have to increase um, production, you know, have more plants online or, you know, it lowers the amount of total need on the system. So that is something that we're going to add into and allow to be counted because it is helping optimize our electric use. Uh, section four gets into some more definitions. Um, that is a pretty standard. I can, if anyone has a question on that, specific, any of those specifically, we can get to that. Um, if someone raises that question. Section five, um, this is dealing with the consumer owned utility and the savings goals. And um, I know in this area, there were some questions you know, regarding why we would increase the savings goal from a, oh, wait a minute, this is, I'm sorry, consumer owned. So this is the co-ops, I apologize. And we are leaving that 1.5% uh, efficiency improvement the same as it is. Um, there's a lot of new language just from rewording it and incorporating in the new um, types of energy uses uh, so that they're incorporated. Um, section six, where did it go? Well, okay, under this same area, when we get to subdivision eight, this is an area that uh, has been one of the, the areas of contention, and this is dealing with the efficient fuel switching. And so I really want to raise attention to this area. And when we look at the requirements needed in order to allow fuel switching to be counted under this program, you have to meet uh, one, two, three, and four of this subdivision eight in order for fuel switching to be allowed. And so uh, number one is that there is a result of a net reduction in the amount of source energy. And that is a measured on a fuel neutral basis. Uh, number two is that there would be a reduction in statewide greenhouse gas emissions. Three is that it is cost effective, um, not only for the utility, but for the participants and the uh, individual consumer as well. And that it is installed and operated in a manner that improves the utilities load factor. So um, I, I think that was an, a, a very important part of this bill. Um, it's really going to limit the actual fuel switching that is going to happen. Um, section six, uh, dealing with the large customers. And I think I've, I might have missed in there with the um, investor owned utilities. Um, they are moving up from 1.5% improvement to 1.75%. Um, that is already being met. So um, 
there is talk around this is going to increase costs by increasing that requirement. They're they're already there, so that was why that was agreed to, and um, th they're meeting that. And it is easier for the the three larger utilities to meet these requirements than it has been for the municipalities and for the co-ops. Um, Section eight, um, that's some uh, dealing with uh, the, how the department will track some of this, some minor changes there. Again, section nine, just dealing with a, a couple of minor changes in regards to um, kind of how the reporting is done and what needs to be kept track of. Um, section 12 is going through some of the things that can be uh, can be done in deals with you know recovery of expenses. But this is where we list out, or I'm sorry, yeah, dealing with the recovery expenses and, and how that adding that into the optimization plan. Um, so section 13 is where we're getting into some of the uh, other options when we talk about pre weatherization, uh, making efficiencies, um, say, insulating somebody's home, um, efficient lighting. This is a big one. Uh, we know we've done a lot in the past around fluorescent lighting and now LED lighting is being added in because we know that's that next step as that technology has come forward with and is a bigger improvement uh, yet over fluorescent. Uh, section 15 is an area dealing with the programs on uh, low income. And you can see in there, we are increasing uh, some of the spend to help folks on low income programs to um, help be a part of this as well. So I, I think that was a, a good a good addition to this to, to open it up to maybe folks who hadn't been able to access this in the past. Um, section 17. Uh, again, dealing with some of the uh, ideas around the uh, fuel switching, and it's talking uh, in more in depth about what has to happen uh, in order for fuel switching to be required or to be allowed into the uh, program. And that is kind of the, the essence of the bill. Um, and again, I can get into more details if members have certain questions. You know, I look at this bill and what we've talked about, um, this is not a bill that is going to be incentivizing a change from one type of fuel to another. Um, that change, that shift is happening as technology changes. Like we, uh, what I expressed when we dealt with the lighting as far as LEDs as compared to fluorescence as compared to incandescent. Um, and it's also there are societal shifts that are happening. And this bill is looking to take what's happening naturally in the marketplace and the shift and say, if the shifts are helping increase efficiency, helping reduce emissions and help lower costs, then they can be counted in the SIP program and help especially the co-ops and the munis make these mandated requirements that they have on their industry that many of these other, that all of these other fuel industries uh, do not have in theirs. And um, I will, I will uh, give over to some of the testifiers, let them make their points um, and I can be available for questions and I can get into some more points in my closing statements as well. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, let's go to uh, Ms. Fontaine for any additional comments on the presentation, and then we'll move on to Commissioner Kelly. Ms. Fontaine? 
Uh, no, I, I think Senator Rarick did a nice job. I'm sorry, my dog is barking in the background. Um, there's like somebody walking by and he doesn't like that. Uh, I think Senator Rarick did a, a nice job. A, a lot of the things in here are sort of clarifying because they're, they're separating out for the customer owned utilities and the public utilities. So a lot of that is just kind of splitting it apart. And then, um, so there's some technical things. And then also uh, the other little pieces he mentioned on um, some of the, uh, the LED lights and getting rid of some old language for lead certification. So it's, there's some cleanup in here too. So it's not just those things, but and I don't. I I was also away with the dog. While I'm not sure if anyone wanted me to go through the repealers. Uh, yeah, I want you to go through the repealers just because we didn't touch on that. Okay. Um, so that's the last section, section 20. And so what what's going on as well is that the definitions are being moved. There are some definitions that are new, like fuel and fuel neutral and some other terms, but they're moving, it's, they're be, it's being moved into a new section. So it looks like all new definitions, but it's really just re, being recodified. So the first repealer is, um, is, is getting rid of that current definition section and moving it into um, the new section. And then the second one, um, is oh, re repealing the current conservation improvement requirements under subdivision 1b <clears throat> because they're also getting their new section in in that uh 216b.2403 and then the last two repealers are just two out of date uh provisions um and then the other one was no one knows why it was a, something that was in existence dealing with a conflict of uh, law between minnesota and federal law so those are the repealers. Okay. And I don't know if there's anything else. I, again, I think Senator Rarick did a, a nice job and the experts, if they come up, can also clarify anything we missed. Sure. And just for the record, uh, we did receive the fiscal note. There is no fiscal implications on this. I did receive from uh, Commissioner Kelly a, a memo today saying that they can accommodate this within their existing financial structures. So. From a fiscal standpoint, there are no implications. Uh, so with that, uh, we will move on to the testifiers list, and then I'll open it up then, at, then for questions from members. Um, we'll start with Commissioner Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, members for permitting me to engage in the uh, committee hearing today through this remote process. For the record, my name is Steve Kelly, and I'm the Commissioner of the Minnesota Department of Commerce. I'd like to start off by thanking uh, Senator Rarick for his hard work in acting as the author of uh, this bill. Uh, he had an earlier version um, that was introduced um, last uh, session. And also I wanted to thank Senator uh, Frentz um, who had authored the um, Governor's One Minnesota Path to Clean Energy initiative um, last year that included uh, much of this uh, energy optimization language. Um, as Senator Rarick said, um, getting to the point where there's a, the degree of consensus that we have has taken a lot of hard work uh, from um, uh, the Senator and from all of the stakeholders. And I wanted to uh, express our appreciation uh, for that. Um, they, uh, the stakeholders have uh, worked hard uh, and in some cases made concessions in order to arrive at um, uh, this bill. I also want to uh, reinforce something that Senator Rarick said um, re regarding uh, concerns expressed by uh, representatives of the propane and delivered fuel industries. Uh, going back to 2018, uh, as the department was looking at improvements to the conservation improvement program, uh, it um, has held public hearings uh, which uh, included representatives of the propane and delivered uh, fuels industry. Uh, and we've also engaged with them in uh, uh, private conversations uh, and recognized their uh, concerns about the bill, but um, we have um, made an effort to engage them in these conversations and their engagement has led to uh, elements of the bill that Senator Rarick pointed out, including the 
uh, the definitions uh, and the criteria applicable for fuel switching. Uh, the energy conservation, the energy optimization pro, uh, proposal that's in front of you today will put money back in the pockets of Minnesota families and businesses by modernizing the conservation improvement program that has made Minnesota a nationally recognized leader in energy efficiency. Electricity and natural gas savings through the SIP program have re result in emissions uh, reductions equivalent to removing approximately 1.5 million passenger vehicles from the road. For every uh, $1 that's been invested in efficiency, Minnesotans receive a return of $4 on that investment. The proposal builds on the conservation improvement program by allowing utilities to create new energy efficiency programs that address fuel efficiency as well as load management. So that we maximize savings for consumers and businesses, the Energy Optimization Act increases Minnesota's energy efficiency goal from 1.5% uh, savings per year to 1.75% for the investor-owned electric utilities. It keeps the goal of 1.5% for Minnesota's cooperative and municipal utilities and 1% for the gas utilities. Many Minnesotans, particularly in greater Minnesota, face hard choices. It can be between paying the electric bill or paying rent. The proposal here indicate, uh, dedicates more energy efficiency resources for low-income households so Minnesotans can heat and cool their homes more, efficiency, more efficiently and reduce their utility bills. For example, this bill could um, mean an additional 2,000 homes in the state uh, could benefit from weatherization improvements annually, uh, which we could all uh, appreciate after this challenging winter. This proposal will help Minnesotans, uh, Minnesota return to a strong energy economy with new jobs and business opportunities across the state. Uh, thank you again, uh, Senator Rarick, Mr. Chairman, and members for the opportunity to uh, be with you today. Thank you, Ms. Mr. Uh, Mr. Kelly, uh, we'll hold all of the questions for the end uh, so that we can have a good discussion uh, with, uh, with all our members. Uh, next on the list is uh, Michelle Dreyer, Electrical Association. Thank you, Chair Osmond. Can you hear me? Yes. Mr. Chair, member of the, of the committee, thank you for inviting me to testify today. My name is Michelle Dreyer, member engagement and government affairs manager at the Electrical Association. The Electrical Association is an organization of 400 electrical contractors and electrical employers that provides education, workforce strategies, and government advocacy for its members, most of whom are small employers throughout the state of Minnesota. From Sleepy Eye to Anemia, Porter to Thief River Falls. I am testifying to urge adoption of Senate File 4409. The bill would immediately open up lines of business and workforce stability for electrical contractors while building a more energy efficient, cleaner, greener Minnesota. Technologies I have identified that may be installed under eco incentives include air source heat pumps and hot, and hot water heaters under the fuel switching provisions, Energy efficiency paired with load management technologies, such as advanced lighting systems with network controls, and load optimization technologies, such as equipment that enables certain appliances and systems, like water heaters, to charge during off-peak times. Energy efficiency incentives provide a mechanism to reduce the time frame of return on investment to incentivize energy efficiency projects instead of continuing operations with less efficient equipment. Energy efficiency projects provide income for our contractor members and product service members alike. While many of my members continue to look for work during the pandemic, or continue to work during the pandemic, they have experienced a slowdown and are looking for other ways to keep themselves and their electricians employed. My hope is Senate File 4409 will preserve Minnesota's electrical talent and enable untapped economic opportunities when needed most. As we learned with the last recession, individuals that are laid off don't necessarily return to the same industry. 
ECO has the potential to retain or expand workforce opportunities all over the state by adding the next generation of technologies to the highly successful energy efficiency programs offered through the Conservation Improvement Program. In addition to providing residents and businesses more opportunities to save money on their energy bills, the ECO Act will send a clear market signal which will retain or save skilled jobs, create economic opportunities, and allow residents and businesses to save money through these cost-effective programs when needed most. Please adopt Senate File 4409. Not only does this language create the next step in energy efficiency, it helps businesses throughout the state maintain their workforce and stay in business. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dreyer. Next on our testifiers list is Steve Schertz, East Central Energy Cooperative. Good afternoon. Thank you, uh, Senator Osmick. Uh, this is a pleasure to be here. First, I want to thank uh, Senators Rarick and Hoffman for authoring this, this important piece of energy legislation. Uh, the MRA, its 44 distribution members and six GNT members strongly support SF4409. As a member of the team, of municipal and cooperative folks who met for the past two and a half years and evaluated many potential changes to SIP. I know the Energy Conservation and Optimization Act is an excellent solution to the inherent problems in the current program for we consumer owned utilities. This group involves several organizations, including other utilities, conservation groups, consumer groups, and the Department of Commerce as we move forward with our goal to modernize SIP. When I said inherent problems, I was referring to the difficulty to continually year after year achieve the 1.5% reduction in energy sales and 1.5% spending requirement under the provisions of the act as it was implemented back in 2007. A program design in 2007 is out of touch with how we use electricity in 2020. Just think about the advances in lighting, appliances, heating and cooling equipment and transportation in the last 13 years. It's pretty amazing. The components of the act are, it emphasizes end use total energy efficiency rather than narrowly focusing on reducing electricity use. And this is across all sectors, including transportation, agriculture, public and others. The goal will remain at one and a half percent annually, but a portion can be achieved with efficient electrification programs such as incentivizing the electric vehicle. It eliminates the spending requirement focusing on results unless the efficiency goal is not met and it retains the exemption for the small co-ops and municipals that is in the current law. The act of 2020 will allow consumer owned utilities more flexibility to meet our annual energy savings goals by allowing us to count electric vehicle incentives, electric storage water heaters, and air source heat pumps toward part of the goal. It will benefit the environment, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and foster a more resilient grid. It will encourage innovation, with tomorrow's technologies. We're already seeing that, of course, with charging stations and what's happening with that. And we see it every day with the changes that we work with with our members. And it will reduce consumers' total energy bills and provide better tools for reducing carbon. That's really all I have to state, say today, but I'll answer any questions anybody has later, of course. I thank you so much for the time that we cooperatives and, absolute, and also representing the municipals have in front of this committee. Thanks so much. Thank you, sir. Uh, next on the list is John Reynolds from the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce. John is on mute. How about now? Now you're on. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, usually I'm a little better with technology, but not today. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify, uh, members and Mr. Chair. My name is John Reynolds. I'm the Energy Policy Director for the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce. Uh, before getting into the bill, I'd like to thank Senator Rarick and Senator Hoffman for taking the time to discuss some of our concerns earlier this week and today. Uh, we appreciate their willingness to wade into the details and unintended consequences of complex energy legislation. Uh, Respectfully, we oppose Senate File 4409 for, in its current form for the following reasons. First, this bill will raise costs for utility customers at a time when many can least afford it. Now more than ever, our members rely on affordable and reliable power. All over the country, extraordinary efforts are underway to help employers continue to meet payroll, pay their rent, and pay utility bills that they no longer have the resources to cover due to the ongoing pandemic. Much uncertainty remains about when we will return to normal, and now is not the time to add new spending into customers' utility bills. 
Second, the bill fundamentally transforms the conservation improvement program SIP, from an energy conservation program to a mix of programming that is at odds with SIP's historic purpose. The expansion relies on SIP's existing funding mechanism, that is ratepayers, but offers insufficient guardrails to ensure that the spending is cost-effective for all ratepayers. This is also apparent in the new innovative clean technology section, which permits millions in new spending with minimal guidance to protect ratepayers. Third, the bill uses the weight of government to tip the scale in favor of certain technologies at the expense of others. Picking winners and losers in this way is inconsistent with SIP's historic purpose. It will cause real pain to those who have built careers and businesses from technologies that are suddenly out of favor. This tilting of the playing field affects both energy technologies and environmental solutions. Again, thank you for the opportunity to testify. We hope the committee will address these concerns before taking final action. Thank you. Next on the list is Dave Wagner, Minnesota Propane Association. Good afternoon. Um, thank you for this opportunity. My name is Dave Wager. I'm the executive director of the Minnesota Propane Association. I just want to make it clear that in our opinion, uh, this bill is very controversial. And I, along with all the members of the Minnesota Propane Association, we vehemently oppose this bill. If passed, this bill will allow each electrical utility be COR public owned to invest in energy cons conservation fuel switching programs. They will be allowed to spend $5 million approximately each and pass this expense directly onto their ratepayers. This bill is attempting to pick winners and losers in the energy market. The biggest loser, as already mentioned, will be the ratepayers. The second will be the propane industry. The Minnesota propane industry serves many rural Minnesotans. These people rely on the low cost, reliable, and clean energy that is provided by propane. They also rely on the many employees of the propane industry. These employees live and work in the communities they serve. Many of their employer companies, which the majority are small family-owned businesses, along with the employees, give back to the communities through involvement in local events, buying locally, and just being good community citizens. Not only is electricity more expensive than propane at this time, propane is cleaner and better for the environment based on all current data. In addition to passing on expense to ratepayers for the Conservation Improvement Program, electric rates per kilowatt will also rise. In order to produce more electricity, power plants are already increasing their use of natural gas. When electricity is generated by a traditional power plant, approximately two thirds, 66% of the initial energy is lost between power generation and final consumption. The remaining one third, 33% is all that arrives in the form of usable electricity. To put this in context, the Environmental Protection Agency's Energy Star program gives propane a source site ratio of 1.01 compared to 2.8 for grid electricity. This means it takes 2.8 units of electricity to produce and deliver one unit of energy to a home, compared to only 1.01 for propane. Propane is much more efficient at delivering energy than drawing electricity from the grid to meet space and water heating needs. In addition, natural gas produces 117 pounds of CO2 per million BTUs of energy. However, when fugitive of natural gas is released in the atmosphere due to leaks and faulty or aging infrastructure, because it has methane, it is primarily methane, it has a global warming potential far greater than CO2. As an example, methane's 20-year global warming potential is 84 times more powerful than carbon dioxide. Its 100-year is 28 times more powerful than carbon dioxide. By comparison, propane produces only 139 pounds of CO2 per million BTUs of energy. It emits fewer criteria air pollutants and greenhouse gases than coal or petroleum. And unlike natural gas, fugitive propane, which has a very short atmospheric life, is not a greenhouse gas. When released directly into the air, propane is non-toxic, it will not contaminate soil, water, ground, it is not a pollutant. 
It makes no sense to switch from propane or natural gas to only have the same form of energy use increase to make the electricity. The best thing we can do is use clean burning affordable gas directly on site to heat hot water to heat homes. Proponents have stated that the goals of the CIP program are all currently being met and can continue to be met within the current budget. So I ask, why this bill now? Propane is clean, low cost, reliable form of energy. There is not a replacement that is more cost effective or cleaner when measured full fuel cycle. Why fuel switching? It will not provide any benefit to the CIP program other than ease the compliance mandate for utilities and increase their load. Why ratepayer expense? This is not the time to be posing a utility tax on ratepayers. They have enough problems and financial insecurities without increasing costs. Based on current electrical rates and current propane prices, right now propane is approximately half the price of electricity. This bill will put people out of work. This bill will hurt rural communities. This bill will raise energy costs and this bill will add instability to the energy market that Minnesota residents rely on. Minnesota propane industry is a very resilient group. We lost a pipeline that brought 30 to 40% of our propane into the state back in 2013, 2014. The propane industry on its own addressed the problem and fixed it without any help. They invested in rail, they invested in infrastructure, they invested in storage, to make sure that they have a reliable, working, affordable form of energy for rural Minnesota. There are a lot of unintended consequences that we have not been given the opportunity to discuss about what will happen to the propane infrastructure and its ability to perform if its base load is taken away from it. That's my statement for today. I will answer any questions. Thank you. Final testifier on the list is Tim Gross with the Minnesota Petroleum Marketers Association. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and the members of the committee. Can you hear me? Yes. Right. My name is Tim Gross. I'm the executive director of the Minnesota Petroleum Marketers Association. Our association represents the 450 licensed petroleum distributors found across our state. This group is made up of multi-generational small family business and farm co-ops that provide the fuels for businesses, family farm operations, and residential heating needs. There are several points that need to be addressed within the discussion of the SIP bill related to fuel switching and electrification of the transportation system. First, the interference of fuel switching in the energy marketplace will create winners and losers, that has been said several times. This bill will give the electrical utilities incentive to increase fuel switching above the normal fr free market rate to meet their SIP goals. This will be done by increasing rebates, and programs, discounts, and direct check checks to targeted potential fuel switching customers. This negative effect, this negatively affects one energy, one energy industry for the better of another, again, picking winners and losers. Second, when giving incentives for fuel switching, the result, the result is a loss of fuel oil customers and revenues for my members. Thus, petroleum distributors will be forced to reduce or eliminate drivers and delivery, delivery trucks. This loss of delivery infrastructure will negatively affect, impact the distribution system, jeopardizing deliveries and increased costs to the remaining rural Minnesota residential fuel oil customers who, who may not have options for natural gas or affordable electricity. The same concerns may ripple down to family farms and rural businesses within, with the potential of unfulfilled deliveries and increased costs. Third, the original the original intent of the Conservation Improvement Program was to conserve energy. This, this bill moves away from that intent to an, an env environmental bill. This bill moves away, and this bill is, is demonstrated by how and for what benefits the fuel switching is included in this bill. And lastly, the 450 businesses, my members, neg negative negatively affected by fuel switching are the same small family businesses that are that are in a current state of crisis. They find themselves experiencing sales down from 40 to 75% and barely meeting weekly payroll, while at the same time proudly fulfilling their duties as critical and essential businesses. 
Again, we believe fuel switching will harm our members and their small family businesses who are a valuable energy stakeholder in our state. Thank you for allowing our interest to be heard. And I'll be happy to answer questions. Thank you, Mr. Gross. Uh, we'll go to Senator uh, Rarick. Um, there's been some comments made. I'd like to see if you have any response comments um, and then we'll open it for additional commentary from other attendees and then bring it to senators for questions. So Senator Rarick. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'll quickly uh, talk about a couple of things. Um, you know, first we, we've talked a, a number of times about winners and losers. Um, I believe the argument could easily be made that when this was originally passed in 2007, putting the requirement of improving efficiencies on the electrical industry in this one segment of the natural gas put them in a losing situation compared to the others. This bill is looking to help bring them back onto a little bit more level playing field in, in my opinion. Um, and like I said, it, as far as raising costs, um, it's so, money is being spent to run these programs the way it is. The, the levels that, that we've increased in this bill, are all, we're already at those levels. And you, set, you spend money to save money. Um, I look at, I think back to when I was an apprentice as an electrician and I worked on a, a retrofit project out at the 3M complex. For four and a half months, over 20 electricians worked there to replace all the ballasts and all the fluorescent lights in every light fixture within one building. So if you think about the cost of that, what it would take to you know, employ that many people, all the materials, and yet the savings that they would see would pay for the whole project in two and a half years. And that's what this bill is looking at and requires. Um, we're, we keep missing out the point that it must prove in order for fuel switching to happen, that it has to be cost effective, it has to demonstrate a benefit to the customer, and it must reduce greenhouse gas emissions. By the propane industry's own testimony, and when I go to one of their websites that gives a bunch of many information comparing propane to electricity, the concept that we're going to switch over from propane to electricity and count it as anything that the electric utilities can use under this program is completely false. The numbers aren't there by their own testimony. Propane is more efficient and it is cleaner, so it will not count under fuel switching here. We are looking at other areas that because technologies are changing, um, are there some fuel sources that will be switched? Absolutely. But it is not because of this bill, it is because of societal and technology changes. This bill is saying as those things happen, if it increases efficiency, reduces emissions and is cost effective, it can be counted for these utilities, the ones who are required to meet those efficiency goals that the other fuel industries are not, not asked to meet. So, you know, uh, I, I have a few other things. Um, I think I will leave it up to some uh, questions from people first. But the, the other thing that I think was being presented was that, you know, this is going to hurt rural areas, especially. And I've had so many conversations with the folks who run the municipals and the co-ops and personally as well. I live in a rural area. I have propane at my place. If I truly believe that were the case, and if the co-ops and the muni munis truly believe that were the case, this bill wouldn't be here today. We live in those areas. We serve the people of those areas. And the last thing we want to do is hurt them. So um, I, I just believe some of the things being said are exaggerated and not truly looking at what the bill says and what it is going to do. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Rare. Um, I know there's some additional testimony that wants to take place. I see, uh, I see you, Steve. Give me just a second. I want to look for people who haven't spoken yet. Uh, if there is anyone who has not spoken that would like to speak on this subject, I'd rather hear from them first. And I don't see anybody necessarily raising their hands yet. So, um, Let's go, uh, Mr. Schertz, uh, Steve Schertz, uh, for comments. Sure, thank you very much. 
just a couple things. First, in regard to the propane folks, and, and, and Senator Rarick said it, one of the things that our employees in the field that handle all the air source heat pumps, all the water heaters, things like that, they have always told our members, the choice is yours. And in fact, if a member has access to low cost fuel, whatever it might be, we say, you know what? Go ahead and stick with that propane furnace. That makes sense to you. We do what's right for the member's bottom line total energy bill always. It is not at electricity first. It's the member's bottom line cost first. So that's important that I want you to, to understand that, and I think you do. But back to just one comment, I'll make it real quick because I've been involved in power plants all my life from coal to oil to gas to garbage to solar to wind uh, and even a little hydro. Um, we can talk all we want about 33% efficiency, but the interesting thing is the change in the MISO marketplace and in the portfolio of generation resources. If we were talking 80% coal energy, 15% gas and 5% everything else, absolutely, I would agree. We would be looking at a, a less efficient system overall in regard to emissions from fossil fuels versus coming and converting to electricity and then that. But we're not looking at that. We're nowhere near that anymore. Do you, maybe you don't know this, but the natural gas plants for Great River Energy less, run about 200 to 300 hours a year. That's less than 3% capacity factor. They don't run much. And, the, and when the coal plants are shut down, they still won't run much. The long-term uh, studies show that the natural gas plants will be needed, absolutely. But they're not gonna run 10% of the time. They may not even run eight or 5% of the time we will be using solar and wind, and those will be the prime sources of electricity. Not today, not tomorrow, but not too long. Uh, we're getting close to 30%, and we're gonna be very close to 50% in about 10 years, and maybe even a lot more. So my point about all that is he is absolutely right. They are less efficient when you convert fossil to electricity into your home to heat it or heat the water. But overall, we're seeing a change in this technology that I think is the right direction to go. And again, Senator Eric's right, we do work with our, our members to make sure that they make the good decisions, not necessarily decisions that makes us sell more electricity. That's just not the way we operate. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, sir. Members, questions to the testifiers? Um, we do have a couple of hands raised. Um, Senator Simonson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, question probably for Senator Rarick. Um, appreciate uh, the work you've done on this bill. I know there's a lot of moving pieces. Uh, you certainly made it long enough. Uh, but my question is about uh, cost to ratepayers, And this is something I've heard about. I know you've heard about. You touched on it a little bit in your testimony. Uh, but I'm just wondering if you can drill a little bit deeper into that and maybe provide some level of comfort uh, for folks out there that are concerned about rates going up relative to passing this bill uh, or not, and maybe just you know provide them a little bit more comfort and me a little bit more uh, details that I can pass along to some of those folks. Thanks. Senator Rarick. Uh, sure, thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Simonson. Um, you know, that we do, um, we have been listening to those concerns and like I said that in the, the section um, dealing with innovative clean technologies, um, originally that was put in there that uh, each uh, would be able to spend up to five million dollars and we listened to the concerns that what that might do um, so that section of the bill has been changed um, Excel energy will be allowed to go up to two million a year and, and then uh, otter tail power and Minnesota power uh, could look to a million dollars a year um, uh, co-ops, munis, there, there's no spending requirement on them at all. Um, but just like I said, I, be, I believe that uh, one of the other parts that I realized I, I missed uh, as we went through the bill, um, the spending requirement, if you're meeting the goals and you meet the goals for three years in a row, then spending requirements can go away. So we're ultimately going to say, Yes, are we going to spend money up on the front end? Yeah, but that spend will help us to reduce the costs in the future. So um, I'm just not 
quite there and to, to see that there is going to be a, a big spike in costs because of this program. Um, this program, again, is trying to get at the idea of there are shifts that are happening um, in society, the, the move to uh, solar and wind. And I think we see storage technologies like hydrogen and others that are coming online. And this is looking to capture those and allow them to be counted into this program where we're you know, requiring the electric utilities to meet that one and a half percent efficiency, and and now for the the three um, investor owns to one point seven five. But the investments that have been made in the past have really shown that they're working. We're making those efficiencies happen. So the again, I, I I'm not seeing the cost increase, and the bill does specify we will be spending money but we're spending money to save money. Mr. Chair, uh, follow up. Senator Simonson. Uh, and thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Rarick. And just to be clear, so everybody's working off the same page, some of the changes that you described uh, were contained in the A1 amendment that we took at the front end of this meeting and folks may or may not have a, had a chance to see that yet. So uh, we should just make that clear. Yeah, thank you, Senator Rarick. Simon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Simonson. Um, I probably didn't touch on that as much as I should have when I went through the original bill um, the, the first time. But yes, um, you know, we we listened to a, a number of groups from the uh, big energy users to people who advocate for uh, low income uh, peop, um, folks that there was potential to raise rates by having that high number in there. Um, by lowering it to where we did, we feel it's uh, going to be much easier to offset that increase in spending with the savings that will come from it. Uh, we can't get out of a meeting without hearing from Mike Bull. <laughs> Mike? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Members of the committee, I'm Mike Bull. I'm the policy director for the Center for Energy and Environment. And I just want to touch on a couple of points in addition to what we heard from the great answers from Senator Rarick and, uh, and Steve Schertz, who is one of my heroes. The, uh, the um, conservation improvement program, one of the reasons it's been so highly successful is that uh, all the investments made under that program have to be cost-effective so that the benefits have to be shown uh, to exceed the costs of the investment. And you'll see that uh, as you look through the, 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 DE, the, the delete all amendment is that that word cost effective is, is replicated several places. It's, it's core and foundational to the, the conservation improvement program and will be uh, for uh, the energy conservation and optimization program as well. Uh, so that helps to uh, address, I think some of the cost issues, but also uh, on fuel switching, in addition to the workforce opportunities that Michelle Dreyer uh, mentioned in her testimony, uh, expanding SIP to include fuel switching will increase uh, efficiency and cost saving opportunities for all Minnesotans, especially rural uh, customers. Uh, it'll support a greater range of technologies and fuel choices for Minnesotans for heating, cooling, personal transportation. No fuel or technology would be excluded by ECO and the same fuel neutral criteria would be applied to all fuel alternatives and technologies. No particular fuel will be benefited or harmed by ECO. No customer will be forced to change fuels. It'll be if there's a picking and winner or a loser, it's the customer that will pick that winner or loser for that particular customer, as I think uh, Steve Schertz pointed out. Uh, the bill will require any fuel switching project to pass some pretty tight criteria. Uh, regarding cost effectiveness, reduction in energy use, greenhouse gas emissions. And I know that our friends in the delivered fuel industry are concerned about the potential impacts of this bill on their businesses. And uh, I'm a delivered fuel uh, customer as well. I definitely understand those concerns, uh, but we were very careful in putting these criteria together. As John Reynolds pointed out, SIP has been working very well for decades and we didn't want to put that at risk by uh, blowing things uh, wide open. The criteria that we uh, put in place are uh, pretty tight and any fuel switching opportunity that passes those uh, criteria 
will provide significant benefits to that minister to that energy uh, consumer that uh, takes advantage of that. Uh, and so I just wanted to, to, to uh, reinforce uh, those points about um, both the cost effectiveness uh, foundation of the program and these very tight uh, uh, fuel switching criteria that I think, uh, I know that, that our delivered fuel friends uh, uh, aren't comforted by that, but, from, uh, but I do think that, that those criteria are awfully tight. Thank you, Mr. Boyle. Senator Hoffman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and, and uh, thank you. Jason, I just wanted to say thank you for um, being open to the suggestions uh, that were given and the conversation to follow up that, that shows really good leadership in trying to put together a bill in this hard times. I mean, this is the face-to-face -face stuff in real time uh, is missing in this. And um, I, uh, I want to thank uh, John and Nancy uh, for sharing with me their concerns and thoughts this morning. And, and again, Nancy and John know that uh, I heard Senator Rarick say at the very beginning, you know, he's here and, and absolutely uh, will you follow back up and, and chat with him? Because, you know, we want to make sure that, that uh, everything that people are saying is being heard because, you know, SIP is a great program and this, I think, only makes it a little bit better. We just want to make sure that we haven't left anything on the side. So, Jason, thanks for your work on that. And Senator Osmick, I want to know why you don't have the same background that Pratt and Rarick have. I mean, look at that cool, funky blue background there. How can I get something like that? Well, Senator Hoffman, I'm just not as high tech as my uh, colleagues are. Uh, I'm actually displaying what's behind me in real time where I am, and I'm not telling you where I am. <laughs> <laughs> so next up, Senator Pratt. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, Senator Rarick, I, I might have, I think my question is maybe a little more technical, and I'm back on line 13.18 through 19. We talk about the net, net reduction in the amount of source energy consumed measured on a fuel neutral basis. And I guess I'm just kind of curious, how do I measure the difference between propane or natural gas use as compared to energy or electricity? Sorry, who was the, who was the question for? Well, it was to Rarick, but then anybody else that would want to weigh in as well. Oh, Senator Rarick, fire away or anyone um, else maybe after that. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'm not gonna try to pretend uh, I can get into all the details on answering that uh, question specifically. There might be others, um, but I believe uh, the, the testimony of Mr. Wager got into uh, some of that uh, very details. What, there are formulas out there that would you know, uh, assign what the, the emissions are for each type of fuel. And so that is what would be some of that basis. And that's exactly why I believe, um, you know, the proof is out there right now that, uh, you know, propane and some of these others are, um, they have lower emissions. And so um, that's, that's what that is getting at. There are formulas that people who are uh, far more into the details on this than I am could probably explain a little bit better, but, uh, you know, it, it, is, it is those formulas that would be taken into account when um, they're doing the, the calculations to determine what is, what's better and what is, um, and technologies are coming that are going to change some of that, I'm assuming, but there are folks who will be working on that and developing that. Mr. Wager, your name was brought up, but would you like to have a comment? Yes, just a... Uh... A, a couple of things. I was just looking at the 2018 Minnesota power generation mix compared to 2019. And 2019 is the last year I have. Um, from 2018 to 19, coal has gone down 6.8%. Um, non hydro renewables, which is biomass, wind, solar, that has only gone up 2.1%, but natural gas has gone up 4.2%. So natural gas seems to be the fuel favored to produce more electricity. And uh, we, we uh, and that goes back to my earlier statements about using almost three times more natural gas to create electricity versus using it directly at the load. Um, so I just wanna follow up on a couple of things that, that uh, Senator Rare, a couple of statements he made um, 
that he readily admits that propane today is cleaner and less expensive. And, and correct me if I misunderstood you. And the last thing this bill wants to do is hurt the propane industry. Um, so, so basically two questions. Is fuel switching going to be incentivized? If somebody changes out a propane water heater and puts in a electric one or reduces a propane furnace as the primary heat source to secondary by putting in a heat pump, is that going to be incentivized? Are they going to get a, re, uh, a financial reward for fuel switching? Senator Rarick. So, uh, Mr. Chair and uh, Mr. Wager, um, if the the requirements that we we're you know just talking about that Senator Pratt brought up, uh, there's the the section where it shows the four. If we can, if it can be proven that it results in a reduction in um, consumption, consumed energy, if it reduces greenhouse gases and it is a cost effective program, there can then be rebates offered, um, you know, for helping offset the cost of equipment. Um, if it does not meet those goals, then there will be no rebate offered just to switch. So, and that's what I believe. You're not going to be able to come in and have somebody replace their propane furnace and get a $250 rebate when you switch over to a air source heat pump or some other form of electric uh, heat if those criteria cannot be met. Okay. Mr. Wager? I said, I, okay, I, I, I understand. I'm just looking at East Central electrics rebate program right now and and they have some pretty impressive uh column rebates column incentives for switching to electric appliances the storage water heater rebate up to 700 dollars uh air source heat pump up to 1250 dollars uh, so they're already being incentivized to fuel switch um just one more thing and and i'll respectfully give time to other people if if fuel switching isn't going to happen if it's so difficult to happen and it's going to be such a very small small part of this let's just remove fuel switching or remove propane from the bill uh first uh, before i go back to senator rarick uh mr wager i don't know if i would necessarily characterize the replacement of existing necessarily as a fuel switch it certainly can because it can be due to the age of the person, the particular piece of equipment, the number of different factors that might go into why someone would switch. And as I've, as I've mentioned to you in previous emails, I personally, within the last 30 days, did a switch from uh, fuel oil to propane. And I looked at electricity and looking at the ongoing costs, and this, so this is a real world situation, looking at the ongoing costs of an electric and the cost versus propane, it was an obvious choice in the long-term benefit. So um, I think that flows into what Senator Rarick has been talking about is that if the cost on the fuel switch isn't, doesn't make sense, it doesn't qualify under this program. So I'll let Senator Rarick speak. And my only follow-up to that is, is you did that, in my opinion, on a fairly level playing field. This bill doesn't keep that fuel level anymore. Well, Mr. Wager, I wouldn't necessarily agree with that because even if you added a number of carrots in front of me to go in the direction of electric to make the buyout and the purchase of the piece of equipment more palatable, the long-term costs were still skewed in the direction of propane. So I, I don't necessarily agree with, uh, with the complaint on the fuel switching, but I'll let Senator Rarick speak more to the comments that you've made. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and um, I might need to um, rely on somebody to correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the, the rebates that uh, Mr. Wager was speaking of are for improving current electrical systems. So if you currently have an old electric water heater, you can get the rebate for upgrading to a new, more efficient one. Uh, same with the, with the air conditioning or air source heat pump. So uh, I believe that's what those uh, current pro what those programs were that he was looking at. So um, you know we're the idea of the SIP program is we're going to 
ask people to make an investment. And like one of the things that needs to be kept in mind with some of these as well, these are, you know, if you're talking about your furnace or these are major, um, major components and you're not just going to do it. If, if you have a five-year-old furnace, you're not going to use this program to change. We're talking about we're at an end of life of a, a system or we're in new construction in trying to decide which we're going to put in. And um, so in a case of new construction, you're looking at cost benefits. There's, you're not gonna get into this program. It's when you're at end of life of a major system like this and you're making your decision, what am I gonna invest in to replace it? That's when these programs really come into effect. And like I said, right now, especially on heating a home, um, yeah, you're, you're not going to switch from propane over to electric and, and the criteria that has been put into the bill, um, would, you know, if, if somebody does de decide to make that decision, uh, I don't believe it's going to qualify for this program. Thus, there'd be no rebates for doing it. That would just be a decision of a customer completely on their own. Mr. Schertz to that point. Yes. Uh, the the idea here is really a SIP program that currently isn't working for the benefit of what it was originally designed for. The change here with the ECO Act is a direction that we all agree. I don't mean everybody in this in this on this committee and and in the hearing here would agree, but I believe it's the right direction to go. Our rebates have been there for years. We'll continue to have the rebates. This program, the new the new program, doesn't change the fact that we have rebates. We just have those because they make sense for our business. The, all sorts of stores, people have rebates all the time. That's just the way our business is to move our product. And the bottom line, in, in my view, is that uh, Senator Rarick is right. I go back to what our members will choose. They'll choose what makes sense for them financially, and they won't choose to just replace something because we have a $500 or $700 rebate. But you know, even the, the bigger picture here is this is a changing technology, the industry, industry, industry the, the energy industry, and the SIP program is not designed to fit it. It's only designed for us to figure out a way to cut a penny and a half, if you will, every time we sell uh, you know, a dollar worth of electricity. It's not an easy thing to do. It's not, it, it's not sustainable, but what is sustainable is what's in the ECO Act. We can make that work and we can get people on the right right direction, whether they have propane, whether they use electricity, whether they have natural gas in their houses. We can get them going the right direction. We think this is the right thing to do because we can use statistics from 2018 and 2019 all we want. Don't use those statistics for gas, for coal, for everything else. They are thrown out the window in 2030 and they're farther down the road in 2040. So I believe what we need to do is modernize this program and that's what this bill does. We think it helps everybody everybody and we're not here to, to switch fuels necessarily that's that happens if a member wishes to if they ask us to and it makes sense for them so that's our position thank you next on the list david s i'm not sure who that the, what the last name is and could you introduce yourself please that's senator senjum oh <laughs> david s is senator senjum okay yeah, senator senjum right. you're up that's my that's my code. Thank you, uh, <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, uh, Senator uh, Rorick, or or perhaps Carlin or anybody else. And this th this question is just kind of basic to the bill, and uh, I'm almost embarrassed to answer or ask it uh, since it is that basic. But this whole thing, you know, so so we have the Energy Conservation Program. It's it's uh, created to uh, use less less electricity over the long term. Uh, and then all the associated uh, 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 carbon, et cetera, et cetera, going going down that path. So as we, if we're going to use electricity, the way the way this bill reads to me, that we are going to measure that on the basis of uh, of of less sales, if that's correct, the less retail sales, not not kilowatts or not BTUs, but less less sales, and. In particular, for a, a municipal utility like, you know, I, for instance, come from Rochester, or perhaps even a co-op, uh, when you when you when you gauge it on less sales, uh, does this bill in any way 
cause at least in a, say a growing community where the where the sales are increasing just because of more load uh does does this bill based on one and a half percent cause you to cause the in this case the utility or the city council to increase rates just just based on trying to keep ahead of the of the uh, of the SIP program requirements I don't know if any of that makes sense but uh, but it, for, for, first of all the question is it's based on retail sales right every year the retail sales need to go down one percent one and a half percent I'm sorry Senator Rarick uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Sendrum, you know, the old SIP bill, um, that is the case, um, the way the program has worked in the past. This is looking to open it up a little bit and change some of, there are still those requirements, but it's more, it's bringing in some of that idea that we're going to be saving energy, not just necessarily reducing the amount of electricity. So if we can show that there is an energy savings, um, that helps go toward it. Now, as far as as uh, we grow and expand, uh, I'm going to have to rely on somebody else to be able to help answer that question, how that might be taken into consideration. So Senator Eric, just to, just to stay on that one a little bit. So, uh, and, and Mr. Chair, so we're, we're measuring our savings, though, I, I used to probably answer this based on retail savings and, and retail sales, in other words. In other words, a utility's retail sales on electricity should go down a, a percent and a half a year. Or do I do I still have that wrong? Senator Rock? Um, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Sendrum, I mean, that is still some of the basis of it. And so with the munis and the co-ops, it's uh, the one and a half percent. And now with uh, uh, the IOUs, it will go to 1.75%, which they are they are meeting that at this time. Um, like I said, this is going to help uh, reform things a little bit so they can count a little bit more in to help them help them achieve that a little easier because it's getting very difficult to achieve that. Yeah, okay. Sure, I, sure, sure. I'll, just, I'll just leave it at that. I'll, I got to think through this a little bit and I might come back with a follow-up, but for now, I'll step aside. Okay, uh, just a brief comment, and and I I might trigger Senator Dibble for for talking because we've been through some of these energy conservation as a as a resource uh, seminars. What the SIP the intent on the SIP program and what this program is is to reduce the level of need, and we always look at electricity, so let's use that as the as the example. Reduce the level of need on the grid for electricity, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to be reducing the amount of electricity that's being used because we have more and more houses, we have more and more people, we have more and more use. What this is attempting to do is reduce the level of need for that additional resource to come online, such as another peaker plant, or as has been referred to, you know, the propane plants that may be used five or six or 10% of the time. Those are lesser needed options for base load or for peaker plants, and we're, we're we're reducing the need for those, and that's where the savings comes in. And I now see Senator Dibble here, so uh, maybe he can agree with me, and we could have another Dave Osmick and Dave Senator Dibble agreement day. Senator Dibble, uh, I couldn't have said it better myself, Chair Osmick. Uh, I think the the best example is California, which has had a robust conservation program that no one would dispute that. Um, they're using more energy in California because, of course, California has been a state that grows. But if you analyze their energy use on a per capita basis, that's a flat line. Um, and so that's a, a good way to think about it. So they're, they've quantified, and we can quantify in Minnesota, the number of, of, of major uh, electrical generating facilities that have been avoided because of our conservation improvement programs, which is an overall savings to Minnesotans and ratepayers. And that's where you get that $5 million of incentive and the, the savings that are incurred within this program is the deferred costs of having to put online additional resources. So uh, once again, Senator Dibble and Senator Osmick are agreeing upon things. <laughs> uh, I am on the list, Senator Matthews next. Senator Matthews. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Senator Rarick, you and I have 
spoken about this bill before. I know your intent. I struggle with some of the overall points on this bill. Uh, we've talked through that. Um, and I'm, I'm reading through it again. I'm just wondering, you know, based on concerns we're hearing again, if we're not making this more difficult than it needs to be, if you're coming in and stating that it's you're not trying to target fuel switching or it needs to be asked for or something like that, can we have the bill say that? Like, do we need those sections in there or do we need a clarification that if it's if it's asked by the consumer, uh, we got to an agreement in last year's committee of removing, I think it was this section, I might be mistaken, but I remember we removed a section of the bill in the committee last year that made a lot more peace in the valley on trying to get this together. And um, it changed then after that meeting and we're back here again today. I'm, I guess I'm just asking if there's a way we can get to that. Um, Secondly, I'd ask on the criteria that is listed in subdivision eight on page 13, where it talks about needing to result in net reductions. I'm wondering if the, if we should clarify that language to have some standard of net reduction. Is a net reduction of one penny or one minutia of measurement of whatever is being measured going to be enough to trigger it? I think you and I would probably say no, but how about the person who's gonna read this and interpret this or a government official who's going to enforce this? Um, if if uh, the concern is we're not trying to get the small propane things that are switching over, then why don't we stick something in there to talk about some kind of sizable savings that would need to be required for it to kick in? So I um, guess I'd throw that out there and would like to hear your thoughts. Or before Senator Rarick, you, you, you talk about your ideas on this, something to the effect of that fuel, that fuel switching can be organic in nature, but is not incentivized. I think that would probably solve a lot of the concerns of the, of the propane industry, or, and I'm not going to put words in their mouths, but if somebody just decided without an incentive package, to switch from a propane furnace to an electric furnace. And I think the fuel switching primarily we're looking, that many people are looking at is going from gasoline cars to electric cars. But it's something to think about. And, and I'd like, as I'd like to hear your thoughts and your comments to Senator Matthews uh, uh, points. Senator Rourke. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, uh, you know, uh, Senator Matthews, uh, you know, he's reached out to me with some of his concerns and, you know, again, for, for all who have been reaching out to me, I've been listening and I've been going back to the group um, so I can definitely reach reach out to them uh, to help, uh, you know, find out if there's something that can be done. I do believe that the, this section and, and what we're talking about, you know, through the, the formulas that are in place that would calculate um, what emissions are, um, you know, like I said, looking at what the, the cost of propane is today compared to um, electricity, that it's not going to meet um, the criteria of this section of the bill, thus it's not going to qualify um, for that switching and count under this program. So um, I, I think I'm gonna have to check with some people to verify, I think a lot of the concerns you brought up are covered, but I, I do agree that there are some um, with the, the second point that we could potentially uh, look at that a little bit closer. So um, I'm, I have a couple of meetings um, scheduled um, with other propane folks in the next couple of days, and I am more than willing to keep talking and I will keep uh, working with the group that's brought this forward to see if there is something that can be, you know, tweaked a little bit to, to make sense and, and help make the protections. I mean, that is my ultimate goal. Um, with the bill, um, I believe this is moving in a way that is uh, best for um, kind of the energy market in general for for the consumer. And but uh, it is not my intent, and I don't believe it's anyone's intent to to hurt any one market. I think this is again. I've, I've said this before. I think what what this is trying to do is there are technology changes that are coming. There are societal. Um, ways of looking at things that are changing and this is trying to help incorporate that and say let's allow that to be considered into this program because 
th those changes are happening anyway. This, this bill isn't incentivizing those changes. It's not driving those changes. Those are coming. L let's let's uh, help with these efficiencies and help this program by bringing them into it. But I'm more than happy to keep uh, working with you and see if there are some tweaks that can be made. Also, Senator Matthews, before I go to you for a follow-up, um, it has been one of my directions to Senator Rarick that uh, we stay hand-in-hand -hand with our friends in the other body. Uh, to put it mildly, the other body has had a bad history of shenanigans, and uh, I have made it very clear that what we get in this bill needs to be vetted out very properly, and we do not go off the rails. So um, I, I, there's some discussion, even though there may be discussion with other players, we need to discuss this with the House too. So Senator uh, Matthews, further comment? Uh, no more follow-up questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Rarick. Mr. Bull, you had your hand up? Uh, Mr. Chair, only if uh, uh, I think Senator Rarick handled the, the questioning very well. Um, I just want one, if there's anything I could point out here is on page 20 of the bill, lines 2015 to 20.22, uh, there's a, there's a, a required um, stakeholder work where, where the Commissioner of Commerce will bring uh, smarter people than me uh, together to talk about how to, um, how to calculate uh, you know whether the deployment of a fuel switching improvement meets the criteria uh, that is laid out in the bill and how to make that calculation the folks from uh, propane are will uh, will be i'm sure the commerce department would be uh, would want um, them to be part of that conversation and, and how to make that those technical determinations uh, uh, for when a fuel switching improvement is is determined to be efficient or not very good any further comments from members or anyone on the call? Senator Marty. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I just wanna say that I appreciate the work that's been done on this. I mean, when I saw the letters, you had a huge number of support letters, Senator Rarick from utilities and advocates and electrical industry and so on. I think it was nice to see because I, I think in the past, as you know, Sometimes the munis and co-ops have had trouble with the old SIP program and the solution was let's just weaken the standards. And this time you're not doing that. What you're doing is saying, let's figure out what it took to get things together. And um, and I do appreciate in several of the letters, I noticed the Otter Tail one and so on, all mentioned how much money the, the SIP program has saved consumers over the years, largely by not needing to build new plants and so on. But it's been a successful thing and I think this bill is a step forward. So. Thanks to everyone who helped put it together. I think the direction too with the munis and co-ops, Senator Marty, is we're, we're trying to give them more options to be able to meet the goals. And it is an intent on, there is not an intent for uh, for us to, to put any business or any industry, particularly propane into any right. vehicle, but it's to allow them if something organically happens that they can get credit for these things as opposed to letting that sit on the table. So I think it's a very good direction. That's why um, I was happy to bring it forward. And, and Mr. Chair, I also would say that, yeah, I mean, the flexibility where they can do three year, up to three year plans at one time and so on. I, I just think when you have a small, a very small utility, 1,000, 2,000 customers, um, it's hard for them to do it. And I think this is gonna give them a lot more flexibility to accomplish what they, they wanna be doing and have been doing, but it'll be a lot more efficient for them and their customers. Senator Rarick, final comments? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. And um, you know, I, I thank you, uh, Senator Marty, for bringing up uh, the support. Uh, I failed to mention that as I started. Um, there was a handout uh, or kind of a one pager that was put out uh, a little while ago that I believe I shared with the committee and I believe it was shared. Uh, so it is online for folks to look at. Um, you know, support is coming from utilities, co-ops, munis, um, electrical contractor groups, electrician groups, um, so a lot of uh, clean energy groups. Um, you know, this, it's had a lot of work. It's had a lot of uh, input uh, over the number of years. 
And um, you know, I do think we've put a lot of protections in it and I'm, con I'm open to continue to talk with folks to see if anything more can be done. Um, like I said, it, it is my commitment. I am not bringing this forward to try to hurt anyone. Um, I believe this is the right thing to help us as we move towards some of this um, cleaner energy and you know because it's technology and society is driving that again this bill is not what's driving the change it is our technology that is the prime driver and again what customers want and and again I, I think that's the other thing uh, this is not it is ultimately the customer who is going to decide what source they want to use and if if they're looking to move from uh, this this is watching and allowing technologies as they change. If it creates a, an idea that somebody wants to move towards electricity and they can show that it saves energy, it saves emissions, it's cost effective, that can then be um, included in this program to help show that there are energy savings. So um, I appreciate all the input from everyone and I'm going to continue to take input and uh, but I uh, uh, would appreciate your vote here today and we'll continue to talk. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Rarick. Senator Rarick moves Senate 4409 as amended be approved by this committee and be sent to the Senate floor. Of course, Senator Rarick, it will have to go through uh, our friends in the Rules Committee, um, but it goes to the floor first with no fiscal implications. It wouldn't, it goes straight up. So seeing no further discussion, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? No. Motion carries. That is the end of our first adventure through video conferencing. Thank you members for coming today. Um, I do not have any bills planned to, to come up in front of the body at this point in time. We do have a number of swirling bills that may eventually come up in front of committee, but until then, this committee is adjourned.